I came across many years ago uh, uh, the subject of Gnosticism. And I began listening to uh, one of the world's foremost Gnostic uh, teachers, Dr. Stephen uh, Heller uh, in Glendale. And he used to have a church here in Los Angeles in Hollywood. He still does have the church, but now it's in, uh, I think it's in Glendale or Eagle Rock in Los Angeles, Dr. Stephen Heller. And he's a Gnostic minister. And uh, beginning to listen to him many years ago, I was fascinated with the wisdom and the knowledge of religion and and the occult sciences and all of the ancient teachings of the world that that the Gnostics were aware of that we today aren't. And so I, I know that Gnosticism is something very important to understand. Uh, the word Gnostic simply means in the Greek language to know. And that's in, a, in opposition to something which is referred to in Christianity as a believer. So in Christianity, if you go to a new church, and they are aware that you are a Christian, they will ask you, oh, how long have you been a believer? And there's all kinds of books written for Christians using the term believer, the believer's house of faith and the believer's book and this and that believer. And so Christians are referred to as believers. That should tell you something. That's a tip-off. Because when, when Christians are referred to as believers, uh, it, it implies they don't know, they believe. And I've said it so many times in the past that governments are, not, you know, governments are not interested in believing something. Governments tap your phones, they tap your life, they tap you, uh, and you know, electronically, they spy on people. We have agencies called the FBI, the Federal Bureau of Investigation. They investigate to see what the real truth is. You have something called the CIA, Central Intelligence Agency. And so governments around the world are not interested in what you believe, what you think. They don't care about that. Governments want to know for sure what you are doing. So they have intelligence agencies and research societies and eavesdrop on people to see what they're really talking about. So the point being that there's a world world of difference between being a Gnostic, which in Greek means to know, as opposed to a Christian who is a believer. So one of my dearest friends in this world that would go back a long time ago as friends uh, is is an expert on the Gnostic tradition, the Gnostic teachings, etc. And I want to talk with him a little bit about that tonight, along with some other things that we want to talk about. So my guest tonight is is a dear friend, Paul Tice. That's T I C E, Paul Tice, in San Diego. His bookstore is called the T H E, the Book Tree. dot com. Um, we'll talk with him and find out exactly how to find his uh, his website because he has a massive, massive uh, printing operation uh, with books on all kinds of fascinating subjects uh, that he and I have loved for years. We, we used to go to old bookstores looking for all the old out-of-print books, and this is basically what Paul has done. His company, again, in San Diego is called TheBookTree.com. And uh, what Paul has done is got, taken so many, many uh, of the old out-of-print reference works on religions and cults and secret societies and religions and all kinds of fascinating ancient history of aliens and UFOs and all that kind of thing, and has a massive uh, printing operation uh, publishing in San Diego. So I wanted to have Paul on tonight because his store and his subjects are just fascinating to me, and you need to know about it and go on his website. So let me ask and see if my friend Paul is on with me. Are you there, Paul? Yeah, we are here. Okay, good. 
I, I tell everybody first because you know what I, I I'm listening to other people's shows. I never get a chance to hear where I can contact the people. You know, they get right into the interview and don't tell you out, out right up front where to contact the person if you like him. So tell everybody about your business and your company and, and how to get a hold of you. And people going to your website will see with their own eyes the magnificent array of all kinds of fascinating ancient books on religions and cults and secret societies. And <laughs> it's amazing what you've been able to uh, to put together and reprint. So tell everybody about your website and a little about yourself. Okay. Well, um, yeah, the book tree has been around for, I don't know, 25 years or so. Really, back in the really that long? Uh, let's see, yeah, yeah. It's at least that long, yeah, because I was I there at the beginning. I'm just amazed that <laughs> so much time has passed. Yeah, it's like a, in the late 80s, I think, we put, published our very first booklet, which was your manuscript. That's right. I sure remember that. Yep, that was the, that was the very first thing, and it's been a good 25 years since then. But, um, yeah, we're at uh, thebooktree.com, but um, it's, uh, it's kind of hard to order anything on there. We have a free catalog that we uh, give – to anybody in the world to ask for it. And it's just full of, it's got everything that we've, um, you know, uh, sell and everything. Um, also, you can go actually onto the homepage of the book tree and download our um, catalog off of there. And uh, at the same well, time, um, if if you were to call our 800 number and get the free catalog, we've got an update sheet that um, it's not available on the website, but we've got a lot of new books that are pretty interesting, too. So a lot of people are calling up and, and, and getting the free catalog sent to them. And I know that's old school. A lot of people like the electronic stuff today. But, um, you know, we like the actual the holding paper in our hands kind of deal. I mean, that's that's just kind of what we've been doing all this all this time. And the electronic stuff is, uh, I think it's, it's good to have electronic readers when you travel, but... Um, I think there's still something to be said about actually um, having a paper book in your hand. Well, look at Paul. I'm of the old school. <clears throat> I think there's a mystery, a mystique about having the old books, all the old books that you find in old bookstores, and then to find that they've been reprinted and 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 uh, continuing to make make them available to new people, new young people today who are looking for the strange and fascinating wisdom and knowledge of the ancient world. Uh, there's something about having all those old books in my library that, you, you know, I don't care. Like you said, the, the electronic media is great, but there's something to be said for having the old books in your library yourself. There's a whole mystique oh, yeah. about that. So well, and you, I and actually... I, you and I know all about that. Oh, yeah. Yeah. In fact, um, there – they're dumbing us down with all this electronic stuff. I mean, in Europe, there's um, probably a few hundred used bookstores in and around Paris. And in Germany, where they invented the printing press, all through Europe, um, physical books are much more popular than they are today because there's a vested interest in all the electronic gadgets over here and the companies that want your money and this and that. But they're really dumbing us down. There's been a couple of uh, major university studies that have been done which show that you retain far more information if you read from a physical book than from an electronic device. Um, across the board, the students got better grades and everything. And um, I actually wrote a book called This is a Book, Why Real Books Are Better. So that's uh, uh, a lot of research went into that. And uh, actual physical books are different from, say, like um, a lot of the movie rental places are out of business now because you can just download a movie. A lot of the um, music Stores are out of business because you can download the music and you get the same thing when you download these things. But with a book, there's still a chance for books in bookstores because you actually have something three-dimensional in your hand. And yep. I say, you know, we live in a three-dimensional world. Let's, you know, let's act that way because a lot of people come into my bookstore and they have these young children. And when they give them a two-dimensional sort of a 
device type thing where you have to, you can't reach in and grab anything. You got to press buttons. There's something missing in the tactile sense for not only children, but for grown up people as well. So there's a whole bunch of, I could go on and on about this, but I know we've got other things to talk about, but, um, um, well, I've heard, I've heard that, uh, I heard a German scientist, uh, speaking quite a long time ago, maybe five or six years ago, talking about, um, uh, uh, the audio and music that we listen to and, and the difference between, uh, 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 what is it, digital and the analog or something like that. But he mm-hmm. said music, digital music is hurting the brain, the human mind. It's, uh, it's not, it's not, um, doing what you think it is. It sounds good, but, uh, the way the brain receives, uh, the messages, and translate uh, the music for us. Uh, mm-hmm. Digital is really hurting us. Digital is not good to listen to. Period. Well, that's what television is today, and that's what the news is, and like you said, everything else is digital, including your phone. But digital is really not good for the human mind, for the way that we process knowledge in our brain. Digital is bad. But yeah, and so and so when you get the digital form of a book, you're experiencing that kind of stuff. And so, right. so I say, you know, um, call our 800 number, ask for our free physical catalog. We'll send it free to you any place in the world, and you'll actually be able to hold it in your hands. So it's 1-800-700-TREE, 1-800-700-8733, 24 hours a day. You'll get, probably get a message center thing, but just say, hey, I want my, I want your free catalog. Send it to me. Give us your address. We'll zip one on out to you, and um, we can go from there. Because yeah. uh, well, I'll tell you what. If you walk through your bookstore and see all the books that you have reprinted, all these old uh, old books that we've found in libraries and university libraries and old bookstores over the years of out of print, major, major, great stuff. From the 1800s, uh, incredible <clears throat> knowledge about the world we live in, the secret societies and religions and cults and, and how all of these strange, dark, black magic works. All of this stuff is in old books and old bookstores and, and, uh, you know, people who, who, you know, deal with old books, they know the value. Well, the here's the thing. Volumes. Yeah, because when these old books were published, I mean, back there was there was a huge um book business going on around uh, around the turn of the last century, uh, around mm-hmm. late 1800s up to about 1920 20 or 30 when the stock market crashed. There was it was before radio for the most part, before television. So the so the media, the way that the the way that we learned about things was through books. So okay. there, there were um, short, there were much, much longer attention spans back then. The, the research was done in much better way, in a much more focused way, and people were just couldn't wait for the next book to come out. For instance, um, the biggest celebrities of the time were those who were for authors. You know, Mark Twain, and you know, and right. uh, different people like that. They were like the rock stars of the time. Because that was the way that we that we really did it back then, and so as radio has come along and with the jingles and with TV with a 60 second commercial with like uh, you know 70 or 80 different edits or something sometimes, I mean we've really had our attention spans zapped, whereby um, you go and find these old books, and you find that. The research there, the the information there is unparalleled today, and of course. it's been exactly. watered down. A lot of people will, you know, right. say, "Well, we need to come up with uh, new versions of this," so because you know we live in this modern world now. But uh, a lot of the stuff gets filtered away that is of real amazing value. I mean, you look at the stuff that Manley Hall wrote in. Uh, Oh and, God, yes! Oh yeah, all, all that stuff. All you, you go into these old bookstores, mom and pop bookstores, and you find some old book in the back of the building, and and uh, and it's written in the 1800s, and it's absolutely priceless information, <clears throat> documents, and all kinds of uh, incredible knowledge about religions, where the religions have come from, 
what the governments are all about, where they come from, and all the concepts and ideas. It's just an amazing array of, of ancient knowledge going back into the ancient world, into the, uh, you know, a thousand years ago. Uh, but people today are watching football and never realizing how much really brilliant knowledge is being missed. Well, I was in, I was in the time. Yeah, I was in the TV business and helping people to watch football or, you know, all kinds of That's different right. cartoons. That's right, television, and stuff. yeah. And then I realized at some point that um, the, it wasn't making me feel well for some reason. I just kept not feeling well doing it, and I'd take breaks from the job. And, you know, I was basically told by doctors, you need to do something different. And I realized that my path in life was not supposed to be in the TV world, uh, you know, offering and helping people to consume bubble gum for the brain which you see on a lot of times on TV. It's just not anything substantial that you can, you know, swallow and get nutrients. It's bubblegum for the brain, a lot of this TV stuff. And then because you and a good friend of ours, Jack Berenger, okay. uh, a couple of guys who I met that were, you know, about 20 years my senior, that had read all these things and that were turning me on to stuff that was just amazing. It just opened my mind. So I realized that... um I needed to do something different, and I started the book tree back then, and it was basically uh, inspired by you and this uh, friend, other friend of ours, Jack Berenger, who, by the way, passed away last week. And um, I know, more, and I heard, and, and he was a wonderful man, brilliant guy. Absolutely brilliant human being, a, a professor yeah. of uh, critical thinking uh, and English, and um, yeah, he not, was sensational not a, friend. Yeah, and so I, I owe a debt of gratitude to you, and I'd like to do a little tribute to him at, at some point during the show because uh, um, he was a revolutionary teacher at his college, and um, they let him get away with a lot of stuff, but it turned out he was teaching a lot of, um, in his critical thinking classes, a lot of stuff that we study and that, you know, basically that we talk about and study, and he was allowed to bring that into his classrooms and teach it, which was which was amazing, but um, it was amazing because young people are are so bored today. They're they're looking for entertainment, roller coasters, and and surfing, and doing something, you know, something to feel alive. And I hear from the young people, and from people generally, uh, that they're bored, they're tired, they're bored. There's nothing interesting in here and there are even people committing suicide because they don't see anything of any value in the human world any longer nothing's there and then i think well if you only knew how much is really there that you've never been told you know you've the never best been told yeah the best information is still found in physical books it's not on the internet it's it's not on videos or you know right. a, a right. lot of this stuff i mean some people are starting to break through and and making this stuff available on the net and that's that's pretty good but at the same time if you know where to look to find the information that is really amazing stuff that's what we're trying to preserve here and and still make available and that was what you know Jack was doing in his classroom and that's what you do in your presentations i mean this stuff it, it really shouldn't be lost and um you know these all of these different companies and all these people in today's modern world trying to make a fast buck um uh yeah, it's right. It's bypassing um, the attention span that's needed to digest this information and, and get the true value out of it because uh, this everything moves in such a fast-paced way today because of um, technology. That, well, yeah, um, and I just got off the show and, and talking about uh, how people today in our world, and especially in America and in the and, uh, North America, but uh, but it's true all over the world. People do not have the power to do anything. We don't have political power, social power to change anything, to modify anything. We we don't have the power to do anything. We just we're we're left to the political leaders and whatever they do, we have to go along with it. Why? Because we don't have the power to do anything. Well, that's why people voted for Trump, I think. We were blindsided because a lot of people didn't realize 
how upset the the mainstream was and how much more they just really didn't want to take. I I'm not saying he's the perfect choice. I you know there's a I understand. Uh, you know there's um uh, there's an ancient proverb. The only thing I'm going to say about Trump is there's an ancient proverb that says, "Coming events cast their shadow before them." That's all I'm going to say about Trump. Yep, and uh, that's true. And there's another old saying I heard uh, many years ago that when a when a little man makes long shadows, the sun is setting. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And so uh it's 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 telling us something about western civilization. Western civilization is crumbling before your eyes and people are now very much so like cattle and and the ranchers who think they own the human race they are stampeding the herd. You know, they stampede us into a war and then they stampede us into this and then they shout and shoot some guns off and then it scares the herd and we all run this way and then we all run that way and one day we're Democrats and the next day we're Republican. And so the human race is like cattle that's being rustled uh out, you know, on the on the prairie and the and the, and they they got horses that are scaring the cattle and uh so I, all of this is based on the fact that we as humans have lost our humanity. We've lost the ability to think and question and perceive uh, what propaganda is happening to us. And well, one other one other thing I would say about propaganda. I like that quote that says, "Propaganda does not deceive you. Propaganda helps you to deceive yourself." Mm -hmm. So and so we are we suck in this propaganda and we believe it and then it affects our the way we view it affects the way we live. It wasn't the propaganda that did it. You bought into it yourself, you know. Well, you know, they say that human beings are primarily emotional beings rather than logical. Mm -hmm. So if you can prey on people's emotions and and get them so that they don't think, which is relatively easy if you're in power, then you well, can take right control of the situation pretty easily by preying on people's fears and this and that. But here, but here's the answer, though. Um, we need to understand where we really came from and, and who we really are. And when we go back into all these old books and we go back and we study the ancient history and the, and the very first forms of, uh, of, 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 uh, of uh, writing yeah. and, and all of the uh, – um, the mythologies and all of the um, stories. Ancient texts, all the ancient texts of the world. You, you start if you study all of those and you start piecing them together, yep. then then we can get an understanding of where we really came from and who we are. And then all of this running back and forth and confusion and being herded together, a lot of that stuff could go away if we could simply gain an understanding of who we really are and where we came from and that is a good it's a it's a good possibility if you know where to look that's what You're i'm right. saying that's and, exactly right and and that's the kind of stuff that you and uh and i have loved for years but that you have uh, been gathering over the years and republishing those kind of research books the type of stuff that zachariah sitchin and I know that you traveled around the world with Zachariah Sitchin and uh, and uh, knew all of the uh, great, some of the other great writers was like, who, oh, Neil, Neil Freer, was it? Neil Freer, yeah. We um, we just lost him about six months ago. And, and Zachariah Sitchin would, would never write an introduction to or promote any other people until Neil, Neil Freer came along because what Freer did was he came along and said, okay, Look at Zachariah Sitchin's work. This guy figured something out about our true origins and, and, and because Sitchin knew the ancient Sumerian language. He was one of less than 200 people in the world who could read it, but he wasn't tied in with any um, – Yeah, any uh, university any, uh, and, whatever. Yeah, so that then he couldn't be ridiculed or anything. He just told it like it was to the best of his ability. And Freer said, okay – Sitchin has figured out something amazing, and it all adds up pretty well. But still, that was so long ago. What does that mean for us today? 
Freer was actually a philosopher, and he was he was so incredibly brilliant, and he put all of Sitchin's work into a modern context, sent the manuscript to Sitchin, and Sitchin said, whoa, now we know what to do with what all this information that I've gathered from the past. Now you're telling us, okay, what now? So Freer... Um, um, he, Freer was just uh, somebody that really needs to be listened to because we can now have a framework for today about what it all means. And so yeah, that's because, why, you know, so many people who are reading Zachariah Sitchin, and I hear it all the time, it's such a, a deep subject about the, how we humans evolved and, and mutated over the centuries and over thousands of years and the ancient peoples and the ancient texts. Uh, from the Hindus and the, the uh, you know Sumerians and the ancient texts of the world, uh, and so so many people are just you know we're just inundated with all of this. We don't know what to make of it. And but like you said, Neil Freer you know, did a street version for us and laid it down so that it's very easy to understand. Uh, you know where Zachariah Sitchin was, where his information was so important. So, yeah, I, and and like I said, Neil Freer wasn't the only one. There, you, you've got so many great authors and great stuff in your bookstore. I'm just amazed how much you've been able to, uh, uh, you know, to amass there. And uh, give the people your your address and uh, everything again where they can go because it's really very important to know uh, and to get the uh, the catalog. So tell people where to get it again. Well, you can uh, just call us toll-free at 1-800-700-8733. Easy way to remember it is 1-800-700-TREE. Or you could just uh, go to the website, thebooktree.com, and, and drop us an email through there and just say, hey, send me your catalog and stuff. And, um, and ordering off the website, is uh, there's kind of a glitch on there right now, so we're in the process of trying to get all that uh, handled. But uh, And I apologize for that. But... Uh, um, That's the great okay. thing That's is the technical world we live in. Yeah. So, um, but you know, we do have a number of contemporary authors besides reprinting a lot of this older stuff. Those uh, in in today's world who could put um, the same kind of context that Neil Freer has done, and just to help wake people up. Mm-hmm. That's who we've also dealt with. The people like you, people like Neil Freer, like Jack Berenger. Um, there's just a, a, lot, a number of contemporary people that we've that we've worked with in the past, and um, so. Um, well, it's quite it's quite a story because when you look at uh, regular bookstores today, the, the ordinary run of the mill bookstores today, the big corporation bookstores, as opposed to your operation, uh, there is no comparison comparing. Comparing your uh, your literature and your your subject matters and the books that you've got, uh, as opposed to what you get in the regular bookstores, is comparing the noonday sun to the faint glow of a firefly. Yeah, There's we've no got comparison, boy. Yeah, if you're in ever in San Diego, if you live in San Diego, come on into our bookstore because this Absolutely. place. Um, we've got so much stuff here, we don't know where to put it all because there's not many of us left. But when people come in here and they go crazy because... Oh, yeah. I mean, it, all the great stuff, all the old books that's been reprinted, they're brand new. But they're, you know, they're going back to the 1700s, 1800s, the 1900s, all kinds of strange, interesting subjects like magic and and uh, and how the dark side... Uh, the religions of the world, where they've come from. I mean, it's a fascinating stuff you have. Yeah, people from L.A. since the Bodhi tree closed up there. I mean, people from L.A. come down here, and and, um, yeah, and yeah. anytime they're down in the area, they they definitely make sure to stop. And we're small, but we've got you know we we choose our subjects very carefully, and anything that's kind of um, uh, hasn't sold for a while and isn't really um, you know the kind of stuff that can help people. Wake up um, goes out into our dollar section, so we got a good dollar, you know, good dollar deal and free area as well. You can find some good stuff even for a buck here. So, yeah. but anyway, we're at uh, the book tree is at three three one six Adams Avenue in San Diego, and um, we're here noon to seven Tuesday through Saturday. So, I mean, there's not many uh, bookstores left, so 
if you if you like books and you're ever in San Diego, especially this kind of stuff, yeah, swing by, snag some. Yeah, up. what was the address again? Uh, three three one six Adams Avenue. Okay, and that's thebooktree dot com. Yeah, I really appreciate you giving me the time to just to plug things a little bit because uh, a lot of people they they don't know where they can find this information anymore. If you go online, you got to know what you're looking for. But if you go into a bookstore like this, you can find stuff, you can discover stuff that is just like, whoa, wait a minute, you know. And um, so it's right. it's much different experience from from going online. And I feel sorry for younger people who are. Um, just using an electronic device because, I mean, you can't really investigate and and discover a lot of stuff when you're limited to just a, a little pocket of thing. That, you know. Of, of course. And see, and the reason why I'm so adamant about uh, promoting your bookstore is because I I am fascinated with wisdom and knowledge and understanding all my life, and I'm I, I know the value of finding some old golden stuff you know that's been uh that's been lost or nobody even knows you know like when you go to UCLA or County USC or San Diego uh university and you go down in what they call the stacks mm-hmm. you go down into the old book uh, all the thousands and thousands of old books that are in the reference sections of universities and you start going through and you find extraordinary, really fascinating stuff on secret societies and cults and symbols. And that's emblems. how you did your research. I mean, yeah, that's what made that. you a preeminent researcher of, uh, of you know, basically you're, you're probably the foremost expert on ancient religions and modern conspiracies because – you went to these places and dug out all this stuff that nobody else knew was even there. And then now you've got all these other people who have been sort of regurgitating all this amazing research. And a lot of people don't understand that you're the grandfather of all this kind of information for the most part. I mean, other people have put in a few other uh, pieces of, of the puzzle, but a large portion of the puzzle has been put together by you, and, and a lot of credit was, has never been given. But I know what you've done, and I, you know what you're saying right now, and these resources, and going into these. I mean, we would go into um, um, there was this one seminary in Pasadena where we were let in basically the back door, and we we would just photocopy all these uh, volumes right, and boy. volumes <laughs> of uh, of stuff that no one else had access to. I mean, if you really want the information, and you know where to look. There is a ton of good stuff out there that would otherwise never see the light of day. You're right. You're right. We used to go to these big seminary, big seminary libraries and uh, go downstairs and they just got thousands of old volumes on religions and cults and, and yep. ideologies and, and fascinating books with incredibly important pictures, diagrams yep. of where religions have come from, where the concepts and ideas and belief systems originated, and all the documentation, all of this stuff, and you and I would, you know, spend hours just mulling through tons yeah, of incredible books. Yeah, five cents a page at the copy machines, you know, <laughs> that's what it was. I've got, that's I've got bound stuff that you will never see anywhere else. That is bound in my personal library. Yep. That came from these stacks that you know, that. Uh, you know, these books were never really for sale, except maybe to universities, and that's how we got our hands on them. But the information is mind blowing. Oh, God, and, yes. Oh, heavens, yes. I and mean, so that's the kind, of, that's incredible. the kind of research material that you used to bring together this kind of uh, uh, of information to the public. I mean, and a lot of people don't know where to look. You did. You still do. So. Oh well, I I I just always was fascinated by the dark stuff all the dark information and all the secret stuff that that nobody knows about you know, all the dark teachings and connections between religions and governments and sciences and you know and how the world really works and, that and you're not going to yeah you're not yeah. going to find this on your kindle sorry pal no, it's no, not gonna it ain't going to happen <laughs> You know. Nope, not going to happen. And, I, and I'm fascinated with all of this. And then the more I, I the, the more I look, the more I found. And mm-hmm. so, and I was doing all of this, like you said, I was doing this way before computers. 
Yeah. I was doing the hard work. I was going there every day to county USC libraries and these uh, five or six stories underground. Yeah, and the vast of majority of this stuff is still not on computers. It doesn't That's matter. Right. The com- not doesn't matter the computers are around. There still hasn't been access to this stuff because nobody's ever, you know, um, shared these sources with a lot of the computerized devices. It's too That's hard right. to find still. That's I mean, right. some of it, some of it you can, but for the vast majority of it, forget it. You know. Yeah, you're right. You're right. That's why I love doing what I do, because I'm fascinated with with what I'm seeing. Uh, you know, and if you if you know what you're looking at, and if you and if you really understand the value of what you have found, something which is of incredibly intrinsic value, knowledge that the people of the world do not have, and here it is in a book and published in the 1890s, yep. uh, explaining and showing you how this and that works. And explaining it and what the words mean and that, and then you think, my God, what an incredible uh, find! But uh, it's in an old 1890s book in an old bookstore out in the back, <laughs> and yeah. I'm just amazed how much people don't know. And yeah, so and not why. only not only you, but this is this is what Jack Berenger did too. He went and found these old books like the Atrahasis and the Enuma Elish and all these other you know reference sources that Sitchin had access to as well. But Jack Berenger, I mean, he took this stuff and put it into layman's terms. So that instead of, you know, going through, because Sitchin can be pretty wordy. There was another guy, that uh, uh, Christian O'Brien, I know we wanted to touch on him a little bit. He was yep. very scholarly. But this guy, Jack Berenger, wrote an entire series of books called you know, the Past Shock series of books. And it, he put these, all of this ancient knowledge into layman's terms. Like, for instance, the the, the Atrahasis, is that, that is... Um, it's this Akkadian, it's this Babylonian epic of the Great Flood, right? And this Atra Hasis is, it's like, it's, it was, he was the good man, supposedly. I mean, this, the Atra Hasis actually translates into exceedingly wise. And this was the guy who was, uh, basically turned out to be Noah. He was warned of the flood and by one of the gods. And he went and, um, and, um, basically survived it by building a, a so-called ark. Mm-hmm. What's, what's interesting is I was reading Manly Hall today, and instead of the Atrahasis, you've got this Navajo version of the flood, and there was somebody named Atse Hastin. Uh, Atse Hastin instead of Atrahasis. The letters are a little different, but, mm-hmm. the, you know. And this is um, uh, this, the, basically the same personage in uh, the Navajo religion, and he survived the flood by escaping through a hole in the sky. So what's really interesting, if you want, like a lot of times, if you want to know what's what our roots are, who we are, what really happened in the ancient past, you got to go to the to the stories that are most common to humanity, and then you see these parallels. You've got Atrahasis and Atse Hastin, and two different cult, two different um, uh, cultures that are you know on the other side of the world, and when you start seeing these things that show up, you realize, well, wait a minute. This is something, there's a flood story that's common to all cultures throughout the world. What was going on here? What's happening? And so you got somebody like Jack Berenger who researches this, and he puts it into layman's terms. And we carry all of Jack's books, and this is not like a shameless plug for Jack. Jack passed away last week, and this guy had never had the notoriety or the, the fame or the recognition of a Sitchin. But this guy, people would buy like 10, 20 copies of Past Shock and just give them away to all their friends because they wanted people to understand in in real simple language rather than having to yeah. go through hundreds of pages of Sitchin. Um, so I just want to you know take my hat off to Jack because um, this guy opened my mind. I mean, he read every single book, and when he read a book that he liked, he went and found the author every single time. He didn't care where it was. He would go find the author to ask him more questions. I mean, this guy was, you know, 20 years my senior. He just passed away a couple months before his 80th birthday. He never lost his curiosity. Nope. He always nope. went out to find out the answers firsthand. And I've got so many stories about this guy. And, um, yeah, so- and he was a dear friend of ours. 
and and he was a fascinating to sit over a, a cup of coffee in a restaurant and sit and listen to him talk about some of the uh, you know things that he was working on, some of the books he was working on. Um, yeah. I, I'm just amazed at how much people don't know, and and that's been my life's passion is to try and enlighten the world to the really interesting, dark, strange wisdom of this world that people have no idea in the world they've been robbed of their humanity they've been robbed of their spirituality and i know that i understand what's going on i want to help people to get back into tune with who they are and find out where all of this stuff has come from and where the religions and governments and ideas and belief systems have originated for the first time Wake up and find out where all of the stuff has come from. And yeah, and, you know, it mm-hmm. gets interesting, boy. Yeah, and Jack's thing was the ancient gods and why all the 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 stories that we share culturally worldwide had these gods. Well, you know, is why why is that? And then all of the legends about the gods have their parallels throughout the world. I mean, we're not stupid. We can figure this out. But everybody tells you that it's just a fairy tale. It's just mythology. But, um, you know, that's what they said about uh, the city of Troy until, uh, you know, uh, right. Heinrich Schulman went there and found out, and he wasn't even an archaeologist. He said, wait that's a right. minute, I'm going to go and find out, and I know this is true, and that's what we need to do individually is say, wait a minute, you know, this make, it doesn't make sense that this would be just a big story. And so you dig, you dig into this information and you can realize, well, wait a minute, you know, you can not only dig into the, the, the you know, the the dirt the dirt and the and the archaeological you know uh city of troy but you can also dig into books like this and and you know find your reference sources and realize there's a gold mine of information out there but if you want to sit home and watch you know big top peewee and you know yep, and, all and, the tv shows and you're never ever ever going to be introduced to what yeah. you could have known if you had just just understood you yeah. could have done wonderful things. You could yeah, have but, you know, the Kardashians are on tonight, you know, so I really, yeah. I just can't, you know, I'm sorry. Yeah. Don't have time right now. So, yeah, I know. And, you know, the New York Times issued an apology. I was just caught that, and I thought that was interesting. They issued, the New York Times issued an apology to the public uh, about uh, about Trump. I don't care about the Trump part, but I think it's really telling they said of themselves in, in, in their apology that they, because they have printed up the papers that uh, that Hillary Clinton has won the presidency. Oh, it, like the old and, Dewey. Uh, yeah, that's yeah. exactly right. And they put yeah. it out on the street. And now it's in the papers. She won. And then when they found out she didn't win, well, in their apology, they said they're sorry. They jumped the gun and printed something which wasn't true. And they thought it was going to be true, but it wasn't. And so they're apologizing to the public and saying that we we will we're really going to make a a, a legitimate try not to deceive uh, people any longer. We're not going to do. We're going to try not to deceive and make up stories, but you know that aren't true, just to sell newspapers. I think that's interesting. The New York Times saying that we're sorry that we lied to you and we and we were a propaganda machine. To yeah, how that. long have they been in business? And how, yeah. all of a sudden now they're going to change. Okay, well. Yeah, you know. now they're going to change. Why? Because they were found out. Yeah, the it's papers like the, already been printed. Yeah, it's like that old story about the scorpion that convinces the frog that he's going to, you know, uh, the frog will get him across the river, just let me ride on your back. And the frog <laughs> says, you know, well, you know, you're a scorpion. You know, how can I trust you to, you know. And don't worry, don't worry, you know, and then the frog brings him over and the scorpion stings him and says, you know, tough luck, you should have known that's my nature. Well, that's right. It's just by nature. I, I lie all the time, you know. Yeah. So, and so uh, I just thought that was very interesting that the New York Times said we were sorry for deceiving <laughs> the people and then writing something that wasn't true and we thought it was true. We wanted it to be true, so we, we put it in the paper. Now we find out that not only was it not true, but in fact we lied and we're sorry about lying and we'll try not to do that anymore. I'm saying to myself, well, it's about time. The New York Times said we're sorry we lied to you. But my question is, 
How long have they been lying to us? All the way back to the First World War, Second World War, during the Vietnam, all this, the crap that's gone on in, the, in America and around the world. How long has the New York Times been lying to us? Yeah, I think there's been a few people. I don't know if it's with the Times. I think there might have been some with the Times as well. So when there were certain reporters that actually did tell the truth that wasn't really supposed to be told and they got their asses fired. That's it. You're right. So <clears throat> it's an incredible story. But uh, Neil Freer, very important. Jack Berger, our dear friend, uh, extraordinarily brilliant guy with some incredibly writings in his books. And the bookstore itself is the book tree. Uh, dot com in San Diego. Uh, also, what was the couple of other people we wanted to talk about quickly? Um, who were they? Some of the others we well, wanted to pay you know, attention there, to. Yeah, uh, there was um, Christian O'Brien. And oh I yeah, mean, Christian O'Brien. Right. We should do like a whole other show about this guy because this oh, yeah. guy was um, he was contemporary of Sitchin, and he was actually um, he came. He came across information that Sitchin didn't come across, mm-hmm. but it, it complements Sitchin tremendously. Oh, yeah. And you know they they had their differences as well. But this guy, this guy was over in um, working England, for the oil companies. Yeah. yeah, he was from England, but originally, uh, but he was, had been sent to work for the oil companies to you know basically uh, scout out oil places to to drill oil, and so he had to uh, he ran across some ziggurats that had been you know, covered over, and he had to, you know, basically get, dig down and, and, uh, and. Yeah, and he, and in doing his job, he began finding out all kinds of strange things. The name of his book was The Genius of the Few. 